On May 30, 1938, accountant Carl Wilkes married Chrysilda Berryman in Bakersfield, California. Just one year later, they gave birth to their son, Paul Emery Wilkes. But on April 1, 1943, they would return to the Bakersfield Receiving Hospital, this time to deliver a daughter. But this was no April Fool's joke. Annie Wilkes is the main antagonist of Stephen King's Misery, a character he created to represent his fear of his most obsessive fans. But Annie's history goes much deeper than what we see in the film adaptation of Misery. So stick around to the end of this video to see me analyze her entire life story, including how she planned to take revenge on Paul after escaping the house. This video is sponsored by Raycon. Quick note, I've been doing a lot of serious looking into the best options for premium wireless earbuds, and it doesn't make any sense to me why anyone would look past the Raycon Everyday E25 earbuds. They have the perfect fit for your ears and deliver that top-notch, clean, isolated sound quality that you'd expect from the top brands on the market. I'm gonna get back to the video right now, but I just don't get why you would spend $200 or more when you could use my link right now to get Raycons, and you'd be getting better battery life, six hours of playtime, and great color options. Visit buyraycon.com slash CZsworld to get that deal. As a young girl, Annie loved going to the movies with her brother, and her favorite part was always the chapter plays. In the 1940s, television was not yet widespread, and the internet did not yet exist, so the feature films were accompanied by newsreels and serials, or as Annie called them, chapter plays. Her favorite series was called Rocket Men. Well, it may have actually been called King of the Rocket Men. Annie's memory tends to be a little bit spotty. She loved the cliffhangers at the end of each episode, and would spend the week thinking about how Rocket Man would get out of his latest dilemma. In one episode, Rocket Man was stuck in a car with no brakes that went over the cliff, bursted into flames, and fell into the ocean. The next week, Annie was there early to see how it turned out, but was furious to see Rocket Man jump out of the car just before it went over the cliff. I stood right up and started shouting, This isn't what happened last week! Have you all got amnesia? They just cheated us! This isn't fair! He didn't get out of the cock-a-doody car! She wouldn't stop yelling about how that wasn't what happened last week, to the point that the manager threatens to kick her out. This incident tells us two things about Annie. First, it highlights her obsessive attitude towards works of fiction, a problem that will only intensify as she gets older and discovers new stories to latch onto. Second, it shows the early signs of borderline personality disorder. She's sitting there excited for the movie one minute and causing a scene the next. She has no control over her emotions and mood swings. Annie was also a longtime sugar junkie, maybe another sign of her lack of self-discipline. Sometimes she babysat for a woman who lived in her building named Mrs. Kremitz, but she didn't like the four kids and called them the brats. On October 28, 1954, when Annie was 11, her family was staying in a temporary house because of a water leak in the apartment, and Annie went back and started a fire in the basement, killing five people, including the brats that she had to babysit. This was an extreme response, showing us that Annie's views on other people were very black and white. She either liked someone and practically worshipped them, or deemed them bad and felt that they didn't deserve to live. There was very little in between. Unfortunately for her father, Carl Wilkes, he fell into the latter category. On July 19, 1957, he passed away at 44 years of age. Newspapers reported him stumbling on a pile of clothing, but it's heavily implied that his 14-year-old daughter had something to do with it. The next incident came January 29, 1962. Annie was in her sophomore year at USC's nursing school when her roommate Andrea St. James was taken out in a similar manner. She had supposedly tripped on their cat, which was lying on the stairs, ending her life at 21 years of age. It was discovered that the cat had also been poisoned, but that didn't seem suspicious because the landlord had put out rat traps in the basement and figured that the cat had gotten into them. Perhaps one of the most disturbing parts about Annie's minimum of eight victims before even graduating from college is the fact that there was a sense of pride that she associated with her accomplishments. She collected newspaper articles for each of the obituaries she was responsible for, and secretly kept them in her scrapbook, often looking back at them as her cherished memories, right there with other normal achievements, like her graduation from nursing school on May 17, 1966. She was an honor student. The first nursing job she held was across the country in Manchester, New Hampshire, where she continued to collect obituaries at St. Joseph's Hospital. Her first victim there was a 79-year-old Ernest Gonyar. 
followed not long after by Hester Queenie Bulifant. There were three deaths that summer, then two more in the fall of 1969. So during that year in New Hampshire, she had nearly doubled her victim count. I would attribute this to desensitization. Her attacks in her child and teen years were very spaced out, but the more she did it, the more frequent her issues became. Then, once she was in nursing school, she was around death a lot more and got even more used to it. For most people, this wouldn't be a problem, but for someone with BPD, in addition to a secret violent past, it could be considered an issue. I would like to point out that the desensitization that I'm talking about is not the same as desensitization to violence in movies, video games, or other media, which is proven to have no link to real-world violence. Each of her hospital victims were older people whose deaths were attributed to long illness or, in some cases, short illness. Perhaps due to paranoia that people were catching on, she decided to start in a fresh new town. A career reboot, if you will. But like many horror franchises today, Annie's life had way too many reboots. And yes, I'm looking at you. It started on March 19, 1970, when she was announced as a new registered nurse at Riverview Hospital in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. This was followed by another two patients that she gave the old, you don't get to be alive anymore treatment to. You know Annie is scary when I'm running out of words to use that won't get me in trouble with YouTube. It was also in Harrisburg where she took up karate, and apparently was very good at it. I would guess that this is also where she gained a lot of her strength, and part of the reason that she's able to easily carry a fully grown man when she's in her mid-40s. Annie also took up a hobby in collecting ceramic figures. Her last victim in Harrisburg was a three-year-old who had fallen down a well and was already in a coma, so it didn't look that suspicious when Annie was unable to save the kid. At this point, she basically got into a cycle. She'd get a job in a new city, collect two or three more victims, and then move on before anyone started to catch on what she was up to. But the reason she didn't stay may not have been just because of her growing list of victims. She was also secretly stealing medication and stashing it for her own personal use. But I knew enough not to take any of the morphine-based drugs. They lock those up. They count. They keep records, and if they get an idea that a nurse is, you know, chipping, that's what they call it, they will watch that nurse until they're sure. The non-canon fan series Castle Rock suggests that she stole medications to relieve her hallucinations, but there's no confirmation of that in the novel. Her pattern continued until 1978, when she started a job at the Denver Receiving Hospital. Annie's first victim in Denver was a woman named Laura Rothberg in September of 1978. But the next headline would not be an obituary, but rather, a marriage announcement? Ralph Dugan was a physical therapist at Arapahoe County Hospital, and according to Paul Sheldon, he looked a lot like Annie Wilkes' father. Marrying a parent-like figure has come up a lot in King's writing. I discussed similar relationships when analyzing characters like Beverly Marsh and Eddie Kasprak. Annie relocated an hour northwest to the small town of Nederland, where Ralph's hospital was located. Together, they bought a house in Sidewinder on March 3, 1979, and during the time that she was with Ralph, she didn't add any obituaries to her collection. Someone with borderline personality disorder may try to use a relationship as a source of comfort to their symptoms, the same way that struggling people might turn to drugs or alcohol. So I think this may have contributed to her break period from the violence. Unfortunately, Ralph was a physical therapist, not a mental one. So leaning on a relationship was probably not a healthy way for her to deal with her issue. Kimberly Holland writes on Healthline that even common BPD symptoms can be detrimental to a relationship, and that these endeavors are often short-lived. Ralph and Annie lasted only a year and a half, and on August 3rd, 1980, Ralph filed for a divorce on the grounds of mental cruelty. Paul suggests that Ralph might have even realized her true nature and luckily gotten out of there while he still had his life. Another note on the BPD and Relationships article states that the person can become very angry and hurt over something that a person without BPD would not react to. They can even become obsessive. However, as far as we can tell, Annie does not necessarily become obsessive about her ex-husband, but rather focuses on her other true love, fiction. More specifically, she's found a new favorite author. His name was Paul Sheldon, and Annie adored his period romance novel series, The Misery Books. Misery had become her new obsession. Annie also loved pigs, and even named her newest addition to the barn after Misery's titular character. Paul, say hello to my favorite beast in the whole world, my sow, Misery. Misery. And I think after finding out that the author traditionally finishes novels nearby in Boulder, Colorado, the object of her obsession turned from misery to him, and she relocated her job one last time to a hospital in Boulder. By the time she started that job in March 1981, she had taken back her maiden name. Annie Dugan was once again Annie Wilkes. It would also seem that her anger over the failed marriage was taken out on her patients in Boulder, and in 1981, she made up for her lost time by taking 13 more victims from May until the end of the year, bringing her total up over 30. But the most 
disgusting of her crimes were yet to come. On January 14, 1982, she was named as the new head maternity nurse, and it only took her two weeks to extend her tradition onto the newborn infants that were kept there. The first incident took place on January 29, with another that followed not long after. When Paul eventually reads about the newborn obituaries in Annie's scrapbook, he thinks that she probably started only going after babies with birth defects, and eventually expanded it to include the healthy ones as well. This theory makes sense, because she at one point demonstrates to Paul that she believes in putting creatures out of their misery when she kills an injured rat, but she later shows evidence of a growing taste for violence when she re-injures Paul after noticing that he's starting to heal. In mid-March, there were five more nursery deaths, and this time an investigation is launched. We are going to be launching an investigation into what happened. I told him that uh, we were launching an investigation. <laughs> Previously, she was always able to get away before her actions were investigated, but this time she wasn't able to do so. And I can see two reasons. First, the fact that she was dealing with infants this time as opposed to elderly people. It's not that unusual for an elderly person to get sick and pass away. And while newborns are lost from time to time, it doesn't make sense for so many healthy babies to kick the bucket. The second reason goes back to her short-lived marriage with Ralph. It's much easier to pick up and leave unexpectedly if you're renting an apartment, but since she owned the house now, it would be much harder to move, not to mention more suspicious. But the amazing part about this junction in her history is that the investigation didn't discourage her from continuing. On March 24th, she made a statement on behalf of the hospital, saying that the culprit may have been tainted baby formula. But in April, another infant hit zero HP, and in May, two more little chonkers took dirt naps instead of nursery naps. By June 1st, they were closing in on Annie, and she underwent questioning by her own free will. They eventually let her go, and maybe that close call got her to back off temporarily, because there were no infant cases in June. But she started back up again in early July, with three more little tiny funerals. On July 19th, Annie was arrested for the murder of girl Christopher, one of the victims that actually lived long enough to be given a name. Annie was given a nickname by the press, the Dragon Lady, because of the nature of the situation where the entire village was basically after her with torches and pitchforks. The best evidence against her was a hand mark on the child's throat, with what seemed to be the mark of Annie's ring. The jury made their verdict on December 13th, and in the newspaper was a photograph of Annie quietly reading her copy of Misery's Quest inside her holding cell. The Dragon Lady was found innocent, much to the dismay of the town. She parted ways with the hospital, putting an end to what would be her last job, but that does not mean that she'd put out her last victim. In late 1983, she picked up a hitchhiker named Andrew Pomeroy on the way back from a ceramic show. Pomeroy told her he was headed to Sidewinder on assignment from a magazine in New York. He was to go make some sketches of the ruins of a place called the Overlook Hotel, which had been burned down 10 years beforehand by a crazy caretaker. Those of you who have read The Shining will be familiar with this location. There are often cross-references to other stories in King's writing, but this connection could share a deeper meaning. Misery is almost like a sister or companion piece to The Shining. Both stories feature authors working on a new project who suffer from the psychological effects of isolation while stranded in Sidewinder, Colorado. The big difference is that The Shining is a ghost story, while Misery has no direct references to anything supernatural at all. However, there are many scenes where Paul and Annie try to get into each other's head and figure out what the other one is thinking, though it's not evidence that either one is successful in the mind-reading tactic known as Shining. There's also something interesting about the weapon of choice in each perspective story. In the book, Annie uses an axe, but in the movie, she uses a mallet. Whereas in The Shining, it's a mallet in the book, but an axe in the movie. Pomeroy ends up staying at Annie's house, where, according to her, they were lovers, despite him being 18 years younger at the age of 22. However, it was bad news for him when Annie found out that he'd been lying about working for the magazine. He was really just planning to sell the drawings on spec. She was also critical of his work, which caused him to laugh at her. And that may have been the last straw, because Annie gave him the axe and dumped his body in the frozen stream bed, where it stayed for the entire winter. Once the stream thawed out, the weather carried his dismembered remains away nearly 27 miles, and he wasn't found until November 1984, a year after his death. Annie continued living in relative isolation with her six hens, two cows, and her pig, Misery. She did sometimes get complaints about her yard from her neighbors, the Roydmans, but it would seem that with no hospital to feed her new victims, her homicidal days were behind her. But in February 1987, she would discover a golden opportunity. On a stormy day in mid to late February, Annie went into town to get groceries and check if the paperbacks of the new Paul Sheldon book, Misery's Child, were in yet. While her copy of the book was not ready yet, she would get something much better. And I'm not talking about the audiobook. She ended up coming across a car crash, and because of her nursing background, she can tell that the victim has the will to live based on the quality of his screens. Now in the movie, she eventually admits that she was stalking Paul when the accident occurred, but that's not the case in the book. But I do like to think she knew of his tradition of finishing his books at the Boulderado Hotel, and maybe went 
out of her way to go past there. The CPR she administered probably saved his life, but because of her obsessive fandom, she makes the decision not to do the right thing by bringing him to the hospital, but instead back to her house, where she planned to take care of him on her own. Annie already considered herself his number one fan. She had taken a liking to his work immediately when she discovered it. But because this is where the story starts, this is where we can shift our focus from Annie's borderline personality disorder to another classification, Celebrity Worship Syndrome. I'm not a fan of that acronym. But unlike BPD, Celebrity Worship Syndrome isn't officially recognized by the National Institute of Mental Health. But remember, these disorders are just ways for us to describe a pattern of mental behavior. It's not quite the same as, say, a virus, which has physical particles that we can identify. But there is still legit research on Celebrity Worship Syndrome, with studies linking it to increased levels of anxiety and depression. Both of those are also symptoms of borderline personality disorder, which obviously led me to speculate in Annie's case, the two are linked. And I'll discuss that link later on in her story. Mr. Sheldon falls into a respiratory depression, so Annie had him on pain medication and fed him through an IV. A week and a half later, she went into town where she was finally able to get her copy of Misery's Child. Paul Sheldon writes the Misery novels. They're very good. I'm looking for the latest one. Misery's Child. I really need that to complete my collection, and I really think you need to have that here. I don't, Misery. I don't have it in the store, but I could probably order it for you. I'm not interested in waiting. Uh, what kind of cock and ooty bookstore is this? How could any of you be in a bookstore when you don't know Paul Sheldon? No worries, I man. No worries. I am looking for a cock and duty book! I can order it for you. And two weeks after the crash, she greeted him as he finally came to. As part of her plan, she kept him on a pain medication called Novril, which worked to her advantage because it made him drowsy so that he was easy to control. She knowingly gets him hooked so that even as he regained his strength, he would always need to stick around to get his fix of Novril. She also finds the manuscript for his next novel, Fast Cars, in his bag and asks if she can read it. When he allows her, she accidentally lets this confession slip. I love you, Paul. Your mind, your creativity, that's, that's all I meant. This is another possible symptom of the celebrity worship disorder, commonly referred to as love obsession, where the person may convince themselves that they're in love with the celebrity despite not actually knowing them. This famously happened when a woman convinced herself that she was the wife of talk show host David Letterman for five years, or perhaps even more cringefully, a man with a YouTube account who publicly released a happy birthday video for Bridget West from the Angry Grandpa Show, where he basically asked her to leave her boyfriend for him. Gotta roll it. Bridget West. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Also, in case you're wondering, the original inspiration to make it look like I'm interested in you was a vlog back in June called Pickle Boy and Bridget Break Up. But I understand that it will humiliate Michael if you really do break up with him. But it's your choice. Ooh, giving Annie Wilkes a run for her money there, my man. Annie reads 40 pages of the manuscript for Fast Cars and criticizes it. In particular, she's not a fan of the use of profanity, and it causes her to smash Paul's soup bowl against the wall. I honestly think this moment is way ahead of its time, because it demonstrates a rather new symptom of her disorder, which I'll just call toxic fandom. Annie is upset that Paul is straying from writing the type of novel that she wants him to write. Just in the last couple years, we've seen this happen with several franchises. Fans start to think that they know better than the artists, and they demand and a return to form, and then the artist either decides to stay the course or cave into the fans' demands. Once in a blue moon, the fan-imposed changes actually end up working for the better, but it's really not worth sacrificing all the original ideas that have been and probably will continue to be thrown out thanks to this trend. I'm not saying fan feedback is always a bad thing, but when the suggestions turn into demands, threats, and thinking they know best, that's where it crosses into disease territory. And I'd rather have an artist try something new and fail rather than pander to the masses, which almost never never yields an interesting product. Modern fans use social media to wage warfare on the artists that they follow, but Annie's method of manipulation involved withholding his pain medication all afternoon and eventually making him wash the pills down with rinse water. Then, the next morning, she repeats her behavior after reading about her favorite character's death at the end of Misery's Child. She throws another tantrum, where she destroys a water pitcher and decides to leave to get a hold of herself away from Paul. She goes to a property she refers to as her laughing place, an upcountry getaway inspired by the old children's stories of Br'er Rabbit and Br'er Fox. At one point she explains, Sometimes I do laugh when I go there, but mostly I just scream. 
While she was there, she prayed to God, and when she left the laughing place two days later, she had the idea that she was supposed to show Paul the error of his past by making him burn his manuscript. She also gets the idea to give him a chance to redeem himself by forcing him to write a new book. So on the way back, she stops in town and purchases a typewriter and some paper. She bargains with the shop owner, Nancy Dartmonger, about the price, because the typewriter is missing the letter N. She brings her charcoal grill into the room and withholds Paul's food and medication until he burns fast cars, which he does after putting up a struggle. That afternoon, she sets up a workstation and tells him to write a new novel just for her called Misery's Return, which was to be her payment for nursing him. Of course, Paul didn't have any intention of writing another Misery novel, but he doesn't really have a choice. He needs Annie's medical help if he wants to survive, and the situation is representative of what any artist has to go through in dealing with these crazy fans. For most artists, they have to balance what they want to do and what the fans want them to do to survive, that is, to make money through their craft while still expressing themselves. In Paul's case, the survival aspect is much more literal. Annie also tries to manipulate him into going with her plan by lying and saying he should be healthy enough to go out and meet people by the time that he's done. What she's really doing is sending a subtle threat. Do what I say if you want any chance at surviving. The next morning, she shakes Paul awake to serve him breakfast, excited for him to start her masterpiece. Paul asks that she give him a different type of paper to work on, one that doesn't smudge, and he tries to give her the idea that there are a lot more complications in the writing business than she knows about, and I find it interesting that Annie doesn't like hearing Paul call it a business. In the same way that she can't see that people have both good and bad qualities, she also refuses to acknowledge that her favorite novels are written for both art and profit. And as you're about to find out, the same concept also applies to YouTube videos. After throwing a fit over his request but returning from town with the new packs of paper, Annie returns to find Paul in a sweating, shivering state. This gives her the earliest suspicion that he'd been trying to escape, but she's able to dispel the thought when he tells her that he'd just been suffering because of the lack of pain medication. The occurrence would, however, trigger her paranoia. She had initially begun experiencing paranoia when she felt that the whole town was out to get her during the Dragon Lady trial, so she would put herself on high alert, which was dangerous for Paul. Her suspicions are heightened again when she notices that one of her ceramic figures in the parlor had been moved, and she wonders if Paul had somehow been out of the room, but again begins to second guess herself, thinking that she may have been the one to do it herself. She double checks to make sure that she still had the only key to his door, and she did, but she still thought that maybe he had found another way out and her years of working as a nurse had taught her to always check her maybes. So she looks in the downstairs bathroom where all the medication she'd shipped from her previous hospital jobs was kept. Again, she had the sense that stuff had been stirred around, but couldn't be sure that she hadn't moved anything herself, so she decides not to say anything yet, but keep one eye open for more activity. The sequence demonstrates that she may be crazy, but she still has her wits about her, and could be even more dangerous because of her cleverness. But two days later, she had been unable to find any more evidence that Paul had left the room, so she was about to drop the idea until she came in to give him his Novril one afternoon and felt the doorknob get stuck. When she opened it, she heard something rattle inside the lock, but again, she shows her cleverness by not overreacting until she was sure. This is because if he was sneaking around, she didn't want him to know that she was onto him. She was better off keeping it a secret so that Paul would continue to be careless and possibly leave more evidence behind, thus making it less likely that he'd be able to one day sneak away. It was a constant mind game between the two of them. So when she heard the lock rattle, she gave him his pills like normal and acted like nothing was wrong. But again, she was back on high alert, so that afternoon, when she helped him into to his wheelchair, she realized for the first time that he was more lively. He was able to move his legs more, and his arms were stronger. She had discovered that he had been hiding his recovery, and the thought that he too was good at keeping secrets. So that night, she countered with the move of her own, by giving him a stronger medication than usual to keep him asleep as she removed the key plate from the door and discovered the bobby pin that he'd used as his key. That's when she also noticed the black marks on the door frame, as if he'd bumped the wheelchair into it while trying to get through. Again, she decides it's too early to confront him and thinks it's better if he's oblivious. A couple days later, now past the three-week mark of her kidnapping him, he's written the first chapter of Misery's Return, but Annie rejects it for the same reason she detested the Cliff Car Resolution and Rocket Man all of those years ago, because the chapter he came up with wasn't consistent with the previous entry. As Paul got back to work on a second attempt, Annie secretly watched him, hoping to gather more information about his escape plan. On March 25th, six chapters are complete, and Annie agrees that they're fair. She agrees to read
read his work chapter by chapter so she can fill in the ends that he was unable to produce with the defective typewriter. Or at least, that's the reason she gives. The battle between Paul and Annie is a mental game of chess. If Annie's move was to get Paul addicted to the Novril so that he needed her, his counter move was to get her addicted to his writing so that she needed him just as much. It was also on this day that she gave the only suggestion about the story that she would ever give, giving him the idea that maybe one of the characters had not died but actually had fallen into a coma induced by a bee sting. Annie seems to be very embarrassed to give any input, which is a strange touch because of the control that she has over the situation. It shows Paul that she's still very sensitive when it comes to the book, and allows him to take one of the few advantages that he can get over her. But this small win for Paul would be short-lived. Annie hears a car pulling up to her house, and quickly goes to get her handcuffs, and the only thing she can find to silence him, a dust rag. She locks her prisoner in place, and stuffs the rag in his mouth, not bothering to take the taste of the chemicals left over on it into consideration. Even though she felt that she had prevented Paul from getting the man's attention, she also had to prevent the man from noticing Paul, since the room does have a window. So she walks him up the driveway to angle off his possible line of sight. The guy gives her a document that tells her that she has an overdue property tax payment, and she explodes on him with anger, even though the guy was actually doing her a courtesy by notifying her. She's still fuming when she comes back inside, and Paul helps her calm down by explaining it to her and offering to pay the fee with the money left inside of his wallet. Annie had basically just forgotten to pay this fee, one of the many examples of her losing track of small tasks, like how she forgets to turn the calendar page in Paul's room, and this isn't a symptom of the two disorders that we've already discussed, but it does show us that she's slowly experiencing an overall mental degradation. With Paul's help, she's able to go into town that day and take care of the tax. From March 25th to April 15th, they have a routine going, where Paul would work on the novel, and Annie would mostly work on maintaining her yard in order to give nobody a reason to bother her. She also cooked and cleaned, she would bring him dinner at 5pm, and afterward roll in a black and white television so they could watch MASH or WKRP. Maybe even some mukbang videos. Mm. Nah, not even Annie Wilkes would watch that. When it got warmer, she would take him out onto the back porch for some fresh air. But on April 15th, her good spirits came crashing down. And despite the dates, this one was not tax related. The main symptom associated with BPD is huge mood swings. And when this happens, victims are more vulnerable for self-harm and self-destruction. On this day, Annie's mood was swinging like a 2015 Javier Baez. We don't exactly know how she got into such a bad state, but she's described as having a bloody lip, looking like a mess, and having some kind of goo spilled all over her. From what I can gather, maybe she was making breakfast and spilled on herself and got really depressed and literally beat herself up over it, she threw Paul his pills and when asked if she was okay, she responded no. She left him to go sit down in the parlor where she repeatedly slapped herself loud enough for Paul to hear from his room. For a manic depressive person like Annie, this was the first sign that she was about to slip into a deep period of depression, which not only included hurting herself, but also unhealthy binge eating that mirrors her lack of self-control when it comes to the consumption of fiction, which comes up again later. I think this also brought back some of her paranoia about Paul escaping. The idea of losing the man she thought she loved made her even more depressed. So she ended up spying on him all morning through the keyhole in the door, which is representative of another toxic practice seen in those with celebrity worship syndrome, something that we've seen quite a lot in recent years with YouTube celebrities, invasion of privacy. There has long been an issue for celebrities where paparazzi would try to capture every detail of their lives, and while I don't think invading the private portion of someone's life is ever a good thing, we've seen it change from celebrity-obsessed individuals simply being the market for tabloid magazines magazines to people tracking down celebrities' home addresses and showing up themselves. Or worse, setting a horrible example for their kids by bringing them to ambush their favorite creators at home. Back in the day with traditional media celebrities, it was an issue, but less of an issue, because they could just hire private security and they were protected. But now with YouTube and TikTok, we have a lot of very young people who become very famous without the wealthiness that used to come with it. So. You know, the merch store is always open. The reason I bring that up with Paul is he has to deal with something similar. He is rich, but because he's at the mercy of his captor, he has no way of protecting his privacy against Annie. And she sees him through the keyhole, getting into his wheelchair to write, and confirming her suspicions about him faking how weak he really was. This would lead to another outburst, where Annie's willingness to let him live comes to an end.
Before confronting her disobedient prisoner again, Annie goes down into the basement to clear out the rat traps because it had been rainy and the rats tend to come into the cellar when it rains. She finds one that is injured but still alive and brings it up when she goes to see Paul. The reason she does this is to draw the comparison between Paul's situation and the rats. They're both captives of Annie and because of their injuries, they're unable to escape. She explains that a rat in a trap thinks it wants to live. As we do, Paul, as we do. We think we know so much, but we really don't know any more than a rat in a trap. A rat with a broken back that thinks it still wants to live. Notice the wording. She's including herself in that too, because she's aware of her severe depression that is making her miserable as well. She crushes the rat in her hand and likewise offers to go get her gun and do the same to Paul and herself. Paul's only saving grace is to say that he first wants to finish the book and she agrees that that's the only thing she still wants to see and she mindlessly licks the rat's blood off her fingers as she spoke, which is pretty disgusting and I think it's there to show us how comfortable Annie is with Carnage and make her threat feel that much more real and scary. Before leaving, she wants to keep track of if Paul is moving around the house while she's gone. She plucks out several hairs from her head and tapes them up around the house, on doors, on her scrapbook that documents all of her victims, cabinets, drawers, and more. This way, she could check which threads were broken when she got back and theoretically see exactly where Paul had been and what he had gone through. She goes off to her laughing place again and again does more praying than laughing. Because of the snow, she has to put chains on her tires to get back down the road. She leaves to come back on April 17th, even though the conditions were very dangerous. But she was not afraid, thinking that God would guide her. I'm guessing that she has not seen Carrie. She almost slid off the road twice, at one point going all time traveler at Silver Dollar City and doing a full 360 degree spin while traveling down the slope. Then, around midnight, her car got stuck in a snowbank, but she was lucky enough to get a hand from a public works crew that was able to free her. So she probably was quite confident that God was actually guiding her on this trip. She stopped off on Route 9 to see if she could see Paul's crashed car, but it was gone. Which was a relief for her because she wouldn't have to worry about anyone finding it and coming to look for him for a while longer. She finally made it back at 4am and finds her victim fast asleep. She comes back and inspects everywhere she had set up her hairs, finding many of the threads broken, proving that Paul had been around the house. She also checked upstairs on her dresser, which would have been impossible for Paul to reach with his broken legs, and finds that her hairs have supposedly been completely removed. It could be that they just weren't set up perfectly and they fell down on their own, but I would guess that it could be related to her aforementioned memory problems. She probably planned to set up the threads on her dresser, but never actually did it. But because she knew he'd been out of the room, she blames him for that as well. She also realizes that the butcher knife in the kitchen was missing, so while he's asleep, she searches around under the bed, where she finds that and some pills that he'd been storing there. This came as a surprise to her, and she must have decided that she'd seen enough. She had to put an end to his rummaging around before he found a way to get an upper hand. So to do so, she turned to a technique originating in South Africa. As Paul woke up that morning, she injected him with a pre-op shot. She reveals that she found the bobby pin that he used to escape the first time, the broken threads, and the butcher's knife, which she angrily throws at the wall where it sticks like a dart. She explains that Paul's tricks won't fly by her. She's been a nurse for 10 years. This is another example of her memory issues or her losing her mind, because if you were paying attention in the beginning of this video, you may remember she became a nurse in 1966, which was actually 21 years beforehand. She asks how many times he left the room. He insists it was three times, but she believes that it's more. I guess fellows like you must get so used to lying for a living that you just can't stop doing it in real life. But that's all right, Paul, because the principle doesn't change. If you are out seven times or 70 or 70 times seven, the principle doesn't change and neither does the response. The 70 times seven thing is not another brand new reference because they didn't exist yet, but rather a biblical reference towards the belief in eternal forgiveness from God, who is supposed to forgive a man's sins not seven times, not 70 times seven times, but always. So Annie is basically saying she doesn't care how many times Paul's been out, she's still gonna punish him with a process called hobbling. Paul, do you know about the early days at the Kimberly Diamond Mines? Do you know what they did to the native workers who stole diamonds? If they caught them, they had to make sure they could go on working, but they also had to make sure they could never run away. The operation was called hobbling. She plans to dismember his foot using very makeshift tools. She has a bottle of betadine to disinfect the wound, which she slathers over his leg, then brings out the axe. She also has a freaking propane torch. That didn't make the movie. She chops the axe down into his ankle, causing excruciating pain. But Annie, after taking out over 40 people in her lifetime, showed no sympathy and reared back again to cut clean through his ankle. That's where the blowtorch comes in. She uses that to burn his stump to a crisp, thus cauterizing the wound. 
This causes the bed sheet to catch fire and she's prepared with a bucket of water to dump over everything. It seems that Annie then started to realize how dangerous her barbaric torture method was. She told him he'd be fine, even as he was screaming from the worst pain imaginable, but she sounded nervous as she did so and seemed to be looking around the room. I think she realized that the procedure had come way too close to killing him, and she was worried that she'd never get to read the end of her book because of it. This fear kept up for the next week. He was in a semi-comatose state, and she wouldn't allow him to go back to his work on the novel when he started to come out of it, because she was still very nervous that he was on the brink of death. When he did go back to his writing, she collected his work at the end of every day, eager to get her fix of fiction. If Annie were around today, she would likely be one of those people who exercise no self-control when it comes to the binge release strategies seen on certain streaming platforms, where an entire season of a show will be released at once. Earlier I mentioned that when she went into the manic episode, it was accompanied by the binge eating of unhealthy snacks, and I briefly mentioned that it shows her lack of self-control, which is paralleled by her lack of self-control in consuming her favorite media. So when she comes in to try to bribe Paul into telling her the entire rest of the story, it's no coincidence that she uses ice cream sundae days to try to do so. Paul wisely chooses not to tell her the ending though, since the anticipation for the book was the only thing keeping him alive. As the spring season was winding down, Annie must have been in a particularly bad mental state, and when she heard Paul complaining about the missing end key on the typewriter, she wanted to give him something new to worry about, and came back with the disinfectant, a syringe, and an electric knife, ready to perform another operation. After Paul's complaint about the typewriter, Annie stormed into the kitchen in another bipolar episode. She was throwing around objects and screaming. She came back into the room and jabbed the syringe into Paul. It caused him to become drowsy and defenseless, and once again she poured on the betadine and held down his hand as he screamed and pleaded with her. After cutting off the thumb with her electric knife, she took it back with her into the kitchen and got to work on baking a cake. This was part of her plan to remind Paul who was really in charge. She felt he was getting too comfortable when he started asking for things again. So this was her psychotic way of setting the record straight. She stuck his loose thumb into the birthday cake like a candle and brought it into the room singing happy birthday. Although it was not actually Paul's birthday, he got the idea when she told him, if you promise to be good Paul, you can have a piece of birthday cake, but you won't have to eat any of the special candles. From there, she only gets weirder and crazier, which may have had something to do with the fact that Paul was closing in on finishing the book, and she knew their time was coming to an end one way or another. Over a month later, a car appears at her house before she has the chance to gag Paul again, and she hears shattering glass and immediately knows that he's trying to get the person's attention. She grabs a sharpened cross, you know, something that everybody just has lying around, and goes out to discover it's a police officer. The guy, whose name was Dwayne Kushner, was stunned to have found Paul, and he didn't even notice Annie before she marched out and stabbed him in the back and stomach several times, sending him crashing to the ground. She leaves him barely alive, then comes and finishes the job with her rideable lawnmower, using it to run over his arm and head. It's the ninth annual Dallas Mower Expo! Be there! Rare, as the biggest names in mowers, hedgers, and clippers, hunting technology! Sea King! Oil paintings! Oil paintings! Sea King! Don't miss the Dallas Mower Expo! Be there! Annie spends the afternoon casually cleaning up the body and erasing any evidence, singing she'll be coming around the mountain as she did so. I kind of wish this was in the movie because it shows how doing something so vile can be a source of happiness for her, and I think if done right, it could have been really creepy in the same way as Jack reciting the Three Little Pigs nursery rhyme in The Shining. She knows that eventually more cops will come looking for Kushner, so she devises a plan to give Paul a little more time to finish the novel. She doesn't care what happens to her after that. She starts by dragging a mattress down to the cellar and brings Paul down there so that he can't alert the police if they come back again while she goes to hide the police car at her laughing place. There's also an interesting conversation that takes place with Paul where we find out that she actually believes that she's not crazy. She sees herself as a good Samaritan because she saved Paul's life. Annie said, I was raised better even if you weren't. You're lucky I didn't cut off your man gland. I thought of it, you know. Yikes! She then goes on to explain her entire plan to him. She's gonna hide the car in the shed, bury the cop, and ride her ex-husband's trail bike to get back. She'll leave a note on the door saying she went off to a ceramic show in Steamboat Heaven. But if they ask her about it later, she'll say that she slept in her car rather than a hotel so that nobody asked her to produce receipts. She also says that she'll be keeping the deceased officer's gun in her purse, so if Paul tries to scream whenever the cops do show back up, she could reasonably take them both out before they're able to react. She does all of that the next morning, and the day after, the cops do show up as expected. She explains to 
to them that the first officer came around looking for Paul right as she was about to leave, and she told him that she did recognize the man in the photo because it was her favorite writer. She also explained that she supposedly offered the guy a cold Pepsi on his way out, and that he had taken it with him. And Annie had planted a Pepsi bottle with his fingerprints on it a couple miles down the road to make it look like he had passed her house safely. She's able to send these new cops on their way without incident, but it wasn't long before news broke that the Dragon Lady was under investigation once again. Three days later, a news crew shows up, which especially got under Annie's skin because the media was probably her least favorite part about when she was on trial in Denver for her actions as the head maternity nurse. She fires a warning shot with her gun to scare them away, but when she comes back in, her old paranoia about the town being out to get her returns and sends her into another manic depressive episode, scratching and slapping herself to the point of drawing blood. More police show up the next day, and they inquire about the injuries she'd given herself, so she tells them that she'd scratched herself during a bad dream. Her secret was unraveling, and she predicted that they'd be back before long with the search warrant. The next day, gawkers from in town came by to look at the house, which continued to unnerve her. At one point, a car full of teenagers comes onto the driveway to make fun of the dragon lady, and she furiously threatens to shoot them if they don't leave. If only it was the late 2000s, she would have known that all you have to do is tuck in your clothes and strike a violent pose. Considering that even just being bothered by her neighbors, the Roydmans who lived down the road got her in a rage before, this new wave of attention was really getting to her. But she's able to get through it when Paul delivers the good news. Misery's return should be done the next evening. When the morning of the big day arrived, Annie excitedly came in to bring him his breakfast and pain medication, just as she had when he first started the book. So I'm gonna use the same exact footage right here. Later that day, she brings in a caviar dish in celebration of the book's completion. She had never had caviar before, and when she tried it, she didn't like the taste. I'm not entirely sure how to interpret that. It could be King leaving his readers a clue about who would win and who would lose, or it could be something deeper than that. She informs him that when the last word is written, his favorite bottle of champagne will be waiting for him, and he requests to be allowed to practice one other ritual he has for finishing a book, smoking his cigarette. Although she finds smoking to be disgusting, she allows it as long as she's out of the room as he does it. She's probably in a charitable mood out of excitement to finally find out how the story ends. She brings the smoke and the match into the room around noon and leaves him to complete the book until he calls her in to read the final chapters. But as soon as she gets into the room, she knows something is wrong when she smells lighter fluid. She freezes and sees Paul holding the lit match over a soaked stack of papers. He sets it on fire, and that hurts her more than anything he could have possibly done to her, because reading this book was the only thing that she had left to live for. She screamed and rushed to try to put out the flames. In her delusional state, she still felt that some of it could be salvaged. She keeps saying, not misery, not misery, another sign that she was living more in the fictional world than the real one. She had never shown this kind of compassion or care for any of her victims. As she's trying to save the burning pages, she doesn't notice Paul lift up the typewriter and smash it down upon the center of her back. This knocks her down into the flames and she screams even louder as her skin burns. She hollers at Paul that she's going to kill him, but she trips over the typewriter. Ironically, the thing that she cheaped out on and caused so many issues for Paul, including the loss of his thumb, was finally coming back to bite Annie. He falls on top of her and she struggles to claw her way out under his weight. Then he begins to stuff the burning piles of ash into her mouth, choking her just as she had nearly choked him with the dust rag. Eventually, she's able to buck him off of her, but she ends up tripping on the typewriter a second time. I've heard of tripping on your words, but this is ridiculous. This time her head slams against the mantelpiece and she goes down, knocking her out for some time. She comes to and sees Paul trying to get away, but again, her previous actions come back to bite her. She's unable to hold onto his leg with no foots to grab onto, and he gets away and closes the door behind him. But desperate to have her revenge on the man who killed her misery not once, but twice, she makes her way to the door and reaches her fingers underneath to try to grab his clothes, but is unsuccessful at holding onto him and passes out again. When she wakes up, she's able to remove the burnt paper from her throat, and she has some time to get a hold of herself and try to make one last go at trying to bring Paul down with her. She's pretty sure that he's still in the house, because her car is still there, and as far as she could tell, nobody had come to rescue him. The doors to the outside were also all locked, making it very unlikely that he'd be able to get out on his own. She jumps out the guest room window and makes her way to the barn, where she would pick out a tool to exact her revenge. She grabs her chainsaw, and with it in her hand, while making her way out of the barn, she collapsed for the final time. Police later discovered her and determined that she had succumbed to her fractured skull. It was the typewriter that had really done her in. In the end, Annie would be known by the community as far more than a stalker fan of a romance novelist. The community would eventually discover her scrapbook and trail of more than 40 crimes. But to Paul Sheldon, who had dealt with letters from many obsessed fans in the past, running into the craziest of them was his worst nightmare. And for the world-famous author Stephen King, Annie was a combination of every uncomfortable fan experience wrapped up and taken to the worst possible scenario. There are many more characters you have to understand to have a full grasp of the Stephen King universe, so click 
click that playlist on the left to hear about the histories of his other characters. And if you love horror, remember to subscribe to CZ's World for new horrors every week, ring that death bell for notifications, and I'll see you in the next one. Assuming we stay inside.